join me in giving a warm Texas welcome to Dr. Carson. Well, it's my privilege to join you on this uh, lovely wet evening. I've only been to Texas a few times. My accent will betray me. Although I live in the Midwest, I was born in Canada, so I say silly things like out and about. And um, I have over my head a roof. You have over your head a roof. Um, but if you pay attention, you may be able to figure out what I'm trying to say, despite my linguistic limitations. If you live long enough, you will suffer. That's my cheerful opening gambit. <laughs> if you live long enough, you will get cancer. If you live long enough, you'll suffer from arthritis. If you live long enough, you may suffer from Alzheimer's. If you live long enough, you may have all three. If you live long enough, you'll be bereaved, maybe by your own children. If you don't live long enough, you bereave somebody else. Those are the only options. And most of us manage both. And that's just the personal stuff. Then there are the tsunamis, the Katrinas. Some of them we call natural evils. But some evils are malicious, like shootings at a Boston Marathon. Some we call accidents, like explosions in West, Texas. There are matters of superb injustice, like the suffering in the southern Sudan, like the cruelties of war. And you have to face the fact that these sorts of issues are necessarily confronted by every thinking person. This is not a peculiarly Christian challenge. If you're an atheist, you have to make sense of it. If you're a Hindu, you have to make sense of it. If you're a Muslim, you have to make sense of it. If you're a philosophical materialist and think that all that is is nothing more than matter, energy, space, and time, you have to make sense of it or deny that there is any sense of it, but that itself is a philosophical stance. This is not a peculiarly Christian challenge. But I want to argue that what the scriptures say about these matters is particularly distinctive. To anyone who knows the Bible, you cannot help but recognize that the biblical writers themselves raise these questions. It's not as if the Bible is written at some innocent Pollyannish level where everything's happy and hunky dory and smooth. Think of the Psalms, for example, where the psalmists wrestle with the sheer injustice they see, whether in their own lives or in the lives of those around them. Think of Job, to whom we'll turn in due course, the quintessential innocent party suffering unjustly. Think of Habakkuk. It's one thing to see that God uses one nation to punish another nation, but what is going on in God's head when He uses a more wicked nation to punish a less wicked nation? Habakkuk's got no easy answer. What do you make of um, Elijah, who fights the idolatry of his age, follows the Lord's command with spectacular courage and loneliness and boldness? Finally, there's a massive confrontation. As far as he's concerned, he's won and then has to turn tail and run for his life, and he swallows his pride, he swallows his certainty, and he's wallowing in a pity party and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Think of the book of Revelation, where even the saints under the throne cry out, How long, O Lord? How long? So what I propose to do in this talk is lay down six pillars to support a Christian worldview 
that, ena that enables believers to think about these things in more fruitful ways. In other words, this is not going to be a set of easy proof texts that will solve all the problems of evil. Rather, what I want to do is lay down six massive, biblically constrained theological pillars, and those pillars together sustain a platform on which to build a Christian worldview that is remarkably powerful. Number one, insights from the beginning of the Bible's storyline. Insights from the beginning of the Bible's storyline. The Bible insists that when God made everything, He made everything good. His closing conclusion at the end of creation week is he saw it and it was very good. And then according to chapter 3, what brings malice and hatred and death and all the results of the curse into the world is sin. Not merely the contravention of a simple rule. Oh, there is the contravention of a prohibition, but it's deeper than that. The serpent understands it when he says to Eve, God knows that when you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. Knowing, probably that means establishing good and evil. The temptation is to become godish, to displace God, to de God God thus effectively to become God. It is the beginning of idolatry. And with it, the curse and death and decay and corruption. Now, quite apart from the exegetical details and so forth, you must see that this establishes a way of looking at reality. It is a way of looking at reality very distinct, for example, from Hinduism where you hold to cycles, where the object is to climb a little higher up the karmic scale and try to avoid slipping down, lest you come back as a beetle. And that means the whole system is finally dependent upon how good you are, how hard you try, how much you suffer unjustly and the like. But it, it really fits into a, a kind of moralizing, balancing act. Or it's different from some forms of dualism, some forms of Gnosticism in which matter is understood to be intrinsically evil and spirit is understood to be intrinsically good. Whereas in the Bible, there can be good and evil spirits, and matter is not intrinsically evil and can be used for a great deal of good. Our ultimate hope is resurrection existence in a new heaven and a new earth, a home of righteousness. Our ultimate hope is not immateriality. And all of these things then are bound up with a way of looking at what the problems are, looking at what the challenges are. Now, that means that in the Bible there is one strand of thought coming out of creation and the fall that keeps saying, in effect, listen, the reason the world is in such a mess is because we are a guilty, shameful people. Now, I know there are lots of other things to say. We'll come to Job. We'll come to innocent suffering and other kinds of things. But this is one huge strand. Paul recognizes it when in Romans 3, 9 to 20, he lays out a number of Old Testament proof texts to show how the human race is, is guilty, Jew and Gentile alike, condemnable. They have all turned away. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And the result of this is summarized at the beginning of this section. The wrath of God is disclosed from heaven. In other words, there is a huge strand in Scripture coming out of the first three chapters, ultimately, of the book of Genesis that insists the mess that we're in, directly or indirectly, comes out of our own sin and idolatry. Now, that's not the only strand. But that strand leads us to be surprised at how good God is toward us. Instead of shaking our puny fists in God's face and saying, it's not fair, why should I get picked on like this? This strand is constantly surprised in Scripture that God does not simply wipe us out. 
you find the overtone to that outlook in some of the words of Jesus himself. Listen to these words from Luke chapter 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So as they're sacrificing in the temple precincts, some get butchered by Pilate's men, and the blood of these human beings gets mixed with the blood of animals. Jesus hears the report and says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, that was an evil caused by an evil man. Then, in case we miss the point, he tells another story himself where it's an accident. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. In other words, what Jesus seems to presuppose is that all the sufferings of the world, whether caused by malice or by accident, are not peculiar examples of judgment falling on the distinctively evil, but rather examples of the bare, stark fact that we are all under sentence of death. God does not owe us life. He does not owe us health. He does not owe us prosperity. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. It is one massive strand running through Scripture. I'm sure that some of you remember that when the towers came down in New York City, on 9-11. There were a couple of well-known American preachers who went on the air and said that the reason these things happened was because of homosexuality and abortion in America. This was the judgment of God. Inevitably, there was a massive firestorm, and they backed down and apologized. For myself, I would say that they were horribly wrong and partly right. In one sense, they were right in that the Bible habitually says things like what Jesus says. Unless you repent, you will all similarly perish. Their sinfulness in what they said was that they focused on the sins of other people. It was not with Isaiah, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. It was those dirty sinners over there without any awareness that people everywhere stand under the judgment of God. It would have been very Jesus-like if they had said, don't you understand, however evil this is, however wretched this is, unless we repent, we will all likewise perish, thus says the Lord. It is one of the major pillars on which New Testament reflection on these things stands. Number two, insights from the end of the Bible's storyline. Now, here we could spend a great deal of time, but I'm going to focus on one simple truth. According to the Bible, there is an eternal state of blessedness to be gained and an eternal state of punishment to be shunned and feared. There is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be avoided. Now, lots of things could be said about both. When I say heaven, I don't mean heaven in some merely ethereal sense. That's merely a formulaic way of saying the new heavens and the new earth, the home of righteousness, a, a recreated order with resurrection existence depicted in many different ways. 
The, the problem when we think about heaven today is that most of us have been contaminated by little line drawings of, of people in white nightgowns sitting on puffy clouds playing harps. Now, I've got nothing against harps. I like classical music, and I think that every decent orchestra ought to have at least one decent harp. But on the other hand, if I've got to play a harp for the next billion years, um, especially if I've got to wear a white nightgown, white does not suit my complexion. Do you, do you see? I'm not sure I want to go there. And, and, and that's how we have come to think about heaven. But when you stop to think of the diversity of images that the Bible casts up about the new heaven and the new earth, they are stunningly diverse, sometimes in terms of spectacular choirs sometimes in terms of great responsibility and hard work. Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Up to now, you've only had a few miserable bags of gold to invest. Now I'm going to give you a real job. Come on in. Have fun. My joy is yours. Did you see? That's a very different image as well. Mm, we're going to be busy there not sitting around in white nightgowns, do you know? And then on top of that, there are pictures of, of, of uh, learning. You recall how the book of Revelation pictures the ultimate crowd around the throne, men and women from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. Well, we've got used to the idea of different ethnicities being there, and we think that's pretty grand. And, Eventually, there will be some Kikuyu there from East Africa, along with some Hutus and Tutsis, and there might be the odd Canadian. There'll be, there'll be a spectacular diversity of people there, do you see? But it not only says ethnicities, but, but every tongue. We don't think the ethnicities are going to be flattened out. I can't see why we should think that the tongues are going to get flattened out. I think the presupposition is that these different cultures get preserved, including the languages. When Pentecost comes, it reverses Babel, not by giving the same language to everybody, but making the same message go out through all the languages. I think I'm going to have to learn Mandarin someday. If it takes me a million years, who cares? <laughs> I got a few million more to give to it, too, do you know? It's going to be a place where you learn and, and grow. It's, it's going to be spectacularly wonderful. And, and the best part of it is God is on His throne and Christ is at His right hand. And all of this created order is, is centered on Him as it ought to be. And so many more pictures. And as for hell, the person who introduces the greatest colorful images about hell, most of them, is Jesus Himself. And one of the things that I've gradually come to recognize, it's taken me a while to see it, is that there is not a single scrap of evidence in the Bible that people repent in hell. Even in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, when the rich man manages somehow in the story's parameters to see Abraham and Lazarus a long way off, he doesn't say, Oh, Lazarus, did I get that one wrong? I am so sorry. Will you please forgive me? What he says is, it sure is hot down here. Father Abraham, why don't you send this guy and give, give, give me a drink? He's still going to treat him as some menial. Did you see? There's no hint of repentance anywhere. Hell is not made up of people who now really want to repent and be good. It's made up of people who are hardened in their Self-promotion. Eventually, he starts arguing with Abraham and telling him, Abraham that Abraham's theology's off. He's going to correct Abraham, and he's in hell. I mean, how, how blind can you be? But my main point in making these superficial observations about heaven and hell is that from the totality of the Bible, you cannot help but see that however important inaugurated eschatology is, that is, the kingdom dawns now, however important it is to live like Christians now, that's true, however important it is to live in the light of eternity, our ultimate hope is not living better lives now. Our ultimate hope is a new heaven and a new earth. Our ultimate fear is hell itself. And that ought to shape everything. 
It's why Hebrews can say at the end of chapter 9, it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. And then immediately the writer goes on to talking about Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. Some years ago, I read C.S. Lewis's remarkable little essay, Learning in Wartime. It's worth remembering what the context was when that was presented. Mark showed me that this library has the original manuscript on which it's written. It's under glass. You can go and see it in the library. It is the original, isn't it? Yeah. The others are facsimiles in there. This one's original. Yes. C.S. Lewis had suffered in the trenches in World War I. He had lost many of his friends there, but somehow he survived. When World War II came along, a bare 20 years later, England vastly unprepared for it. The man in charge of Oxford's university chapel didn't really know what to say to this new generation of young men waiting to be butchered. And because Lewis had suffered through the First World War, and by this time was establishing something of a Christian credibility as a defender of the faith, he was asked to speak to the university crowd. And on one distinctive Sunday evening, he climbed into the tall pulpit, and this is what he said. I'm going to read a fairly extensive bit here. A university is a society for the pursuit of learning. As students, you will be expected to make yourselves, or to start making yourselves, into what the Middle Ages called clerks, into philosophers, scientists, scholars, critics, or historians. And at first sight, this seems to be an odd thing to do during a great war. What is the use of beginning a task which we have so little chance of finishing? Or even if we ourselves should happen not to be interrupted by death or military service, why should we, indeed, how can we, continue to take an interest in these placid occupations when the lives of our friends and the liberties of Europe are in the balance? Is it not like fiddling while Rome burns? Now, it seems to me that we shall not be able to answer these questions until we have put them by the side of certain other questions which every Christian ought to have asked himself in peacetime. I spoke just now of fiddling while Rome burns, but to a Christian, the true tragedy of Nero must be not that he fiddled while the city was on fire, but that he fiddled on the brink of hell. You must forgive me for the crude monosyllable. I know that many wiser and better Christians than I these days do not like to mention heaven and hell, even in a pulpit. I know, too, that nearly all the references to this subject in the New Testament come from a single source, but then that source is our Lord Himself. People will tell you it is St. Paul, but that is untrue. These overwhelming doctrines are dominical. They are not really removable from the teaching of Christ or of His church. If we do not believe them, our presence in this church is great tomfoolery. If we do, we must sometimes overcome our spiritual prudery and mention them. The moment we do so, we can see that every Christian who comes to a university must at all times face a question compared with which the questions raised by the war are relatively unimportant. He must ask himself how it is right, or even psychologically possible, for creatures who are every moment advancing either to heaven or to hell to spend any fraction of the little time allowed them in this world on such comparative trivialities as literature or art, mathematics or biology. If human culture can stand up to that, it can stand up to anything. To admit that we can retain our interest in learning under the shadow of these eternal issues, but not under the shadow of a European war, would be to admit that our ears are closed to the voice of reason and very wide open to the voice of our nerves and our mass emotions. Let me read you a few more lines from the end of the essay. War threatens us with death and pain. No man and especially no Christian who remembers Gethsemane need try to attain a stoic indifference about these things. But he, we can guard against the illusions of the imagination 
We think of the streets of Warsaw and contrast the deaths there suffered with an abstraction called life. But there is no question of death or life for any of us. Only a question of this da death or of that death. Of a machine gun bullet now or cancer 40 years later. What does war do to death? It certainly does not make it more frequent. 100% of us die. The percentage cannot be increased. It puts several deaths earlier, but I hardly suppose that that is what we fear. Certainly, when the moment comes, it will make little difference how many years we have behind us. Does it increase our chances of a painful death? I doubt it. As far as I can find out, what we call natural death is usually preceded by suffering, and the battlefield is one of the very few places where one has a reasonable prospect of dying with no pain at all. Does it decrease our chances of dying at peace with God? I cannot believe it. If military service does not persuade a man to prepare for death, what conceivable concatenation of circumstances would? Yet war does do something to death. It forces us to remember it. The only reason why the cancer at 60 or the paralysis at 75 do not bother us is that we forget them. War makes death real to us. And that would have been regarded as one of its blessings by most of the great Christians of the past. They thought it good for us to be always aware of our mortality. I am inclined to think they were right. All the animal life in us, all schemes of happiness that centered in this world were always doomed to a final frustration. In ordinary times, only a wise man can realize it. Now the stupidest of us knows. We see unmistakably the sort of universe in which we have all along been living and must come to terms with it. If we had foolish, unchristian hopes about human culture, they are now shattered. If we thought we were building up a heaven on earth, if we looked for something the world that, that would turn out in the present world, uh, for, to move us from a place of pilgrimage into a permanent city satisfying the soul of man, we are disillusioned and not a moment too soon. Do you hear what Lewis is saying? So many of these sufferings have the effect of forcing us to deny that any utopia in this world is possible. Of course, Christians will feel called to justify this political stance or that economic theory, thinking that this way is better than that way. But if we become so attached to these views that somehow, if we simply follow my political party, then we will have utopia, we have forgotten. This is a damned world. We have just come through the bloodiest century in human history. And for the life of me, I cannot think of a single reason why this century may not be bloodier. But many of us walk through life thinking that somehow human life is perfectible so long as we get our politics right. We're still a damned race. Number three, insights from the place of innocent suffering. Now let me say a few words about Job. I'm sure you remember the setting. Satan comes to God and says, um, I'm reporting in along with the other sons of God. And God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? He's a remarkable man. He's a tom man in Hebrew. He's a perfect man, utterly mature. And Satan says, oh, yes, 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 yes. That's because you've surrounded him with good things. He's spoiled rotten. Take away all his toys and his amusements and his wealth, and, and he'll curse you to your face. And God says, go ahead, just spare his body. So marauding bands of Chaldeans and Sabaeans and others come in and take away his tens of thousands of sheep and cattle, donkeys, which means that economically he's wiped out. Then a windstorm comes in and collapses the house where his ten children are having a party, and they all die. And he says, Naked I came hither, naked I will return. <laughs> 
the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And Job says, yeah, 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 yeah. Skin for skin, take away his health and he'll curse you to his face. And God says, go ahead, do whatever you like, but leave him alive. And pretty soon, Job is suffering horribly, sitting in an ash pit, picking at his scabs with broken pieces of, ha of, of pottery. His wife tells him to curse God and die. And still he refuses to curse God. Then the three miserable comforters fly in. The only smart thing they do is shut up for the first week. And then they start thinking things out theologically. Uh, Job, do you believe that God is good? Yes. Do you believe that God is sovereign? Yes. Do you believe that he's a perfect judge? Of course. So, Job says, listen, I know God is good, and I, I, I know God is sovereign, but the fact is that human beings are born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. You, 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 that, that too is part of present reality. And the friends say, but if God is good and if God is sovereign, then if you are suffering, must it not be because God is punishing you? You don't think that this punishment is outside the bounds of God's sovereignty, do you? No, no, I don't think that it's outside the bounds of God's sovereignty, but I've got to tell you, what I'm, what I'm suffering is not fair. <gasps> Job, did you say not fair? Are you call, calling God unjust? No, 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 I don't want to do that. And the tension builds and till, builds and builds until eventually Job says, what I really need is a lawyer. You're pushed pretty far if you ask for a lawyer before the Almighty. And in the midst of his suffering... He says some remarkably profound things. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And on the other hand, he's right on the edge of calling God out, as it were. And eventually, after more toing and froing, God speaks. What does he say? Job, have you ever designed a snowflake? You can't say that I have. How about a hippopotamus? Did you ever design a hippopotamus, hmm, Job? Were you around when I cast the constellation Orion into the skies, Job? Hmm? Hmm? Rhetorical question after rhetorical question after rhetorical question. None of them answering Job's questions. But Job seems to get the point. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I spoke too soon. I get the point. I have lots of things I don't understand. I'm acting as if I do. I, I, I repent and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And God says, I haven't finished with you yet. I've got two more chapters of, of, of rhetorical questions. Stand up on your feet. Listen up. <laughs> and at the end of it all, Job does not say, ah, now I understand. He says, I repent. Not... I repent for certain sins that brought this judgment on me in the first place because that would be going back to the theology of the false counselors. But I repent of ever talking and thinking against you like that. There are just too many things I don't understand. And God says, Job has spoken the right things about me. The miserable friends haven't because they thought they could explain everything to do with God's providential matters over injustice and innocent suffering as if it was all in a nice little box. And you will face the wrath of God, you three, unless Job intercedes for you. And then along comes chapter 42, and now the critics are miserable. Up until now, they think Job is wonderful. Oh, it's, it, it, it's so ethically ambiguous. Who, who's good? Who's, who's bad? No real answers. It's, 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 it's spectacular. It's like the film Crash. You can't decide who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. They all switch roles. So Job is wonderful. And then you get chapter 42. 
God blesses Job with twice as many sheep, and twice as many cattle, and twice as many donkeys, just the same number of children. I mean, pity his wife. Ten more is enough. And, 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 and the critics say, this is so stupid. This is going back to 1950s films, you know, with, with, with the white hats and the black hats, and you know who the good guys are, and it all comes out with an easy Pollyannish conclusion at the end. This, this, this goes to show that, that it must have been some rather stupid editor who tacked chapter 42 on at the end. But in fact, Job 42 is to the rest of Job what Revelation 21 and 22 is to the rest of the book of Revelation. In the end, not only does God win, and not only is justice done, but justice is seen to be done. And that's important for the book of Job. But meanwhile, until that end, we live in all kinds of ambiguities where we do not know the mind of God, and we dare not act as if God owes us detailed explanations. There are times when the godliest thing we can do is say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. God wants our trust more than he wants our understanding. Don't misunderstand me. God wants us to understand whatever he has disclosed. God wants us to grow in knowledge and experience, and grasp, and sweep. But he wants our trust more than mere intellectual comprehension. He wants our faith. So, those are three pillars. Number four, insights from the mystery of providence. Now, in some ways, this is tied to the last one, but it's worth a special note on its own. Insights from the Mystery of Providence. Now, this is going to be the most difficult part of tonight's lecture. If you want a little snooze, now's your chance. <laughs> it, it'll become a little more interesting again in, in a few minutes, but if, if you need to take an intellectual break, this is when you should take it. I'm going to begin with two propositions, both of which, I insist, are taught in Scripture. And belief in both of those propositions simultaneously is what some philosophers call compatibilism. I insist that compatibilism is taught by Scripture. Now, let me back off a little bit. The two propositions, both of which, I insist, are taught by Scripture again and again and again. We'll look at some passages in a moment are these. Number one, God is absolutely and unqualifiedly sovereign, but His sovereignty never functions to mitigate human responsibility. That's the first proposition. I repeat it. God is absolutely unqualifiedly sovereign, but His sovereignty never functions to mitigate human responsibility. That's the first proposition. Number two, Men and women are morally responsible creatures. By that I mean they believe and disbelieve. They choose to do this or choose to do that. They obey, they disobey, and those actions are morally significant. They are morally responsible creatures, but their moral responsibility before God never makes God absolutely contingent. And I insist that those two propositions are taught in myriads of ways across all of the Bible. Let me give you three examples. There are lots and lots of texts when one proposition or the other is taught, but there are some texts where both together are clearly presupposed and sometimes explicitly taught. At the end of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 and 20, after the old man has died, Joseph's brothers come to him and say, you know, before he died, the old man said you were to treat us nicely because they're afraid he's now going to wreak havoc upon them and take his revenge. Joseph is distressed that they think so poorly of him. And he looks back on what they did selling him as a slave. 
And he says to them, God intended it for evil. Uh, You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Now, notice what he does not say. He does not say, you intended it for evil, and sadly, God was taking a walk that day, and he missed it. It it, it slipped by him somehow, Uh, but because he's such a marvelous chess player, he, he knew all the counter moves, and eventually he made it turn out all right in the end. He doesn't say that. Nor does he say, God was planning on sending me down to Egypt in an air-conditioned limousine, but unfortunately, you guys came along and mucked up his plans, and as a result, I went down there as a slave. He doesn't say that either. But rather, in one and the same event, human beings were morally accountable for what they did. You intended it for evil, and God intended it for good. So that the human beings in this event are held accountable before God for the evil that they have done, and God is to be praised for the good that He did. And if you say, boy, that sounds a bit too convenient for God, what I have to say is, that's the way it is everywhere in Scripture. Get used to it. It's bound up with the mystery of providence. Let me give you another example. This one from the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 10. Or, if you don't like my accent, you may say Isaiah. <laughs> my wife is English, and I lived there such a long time that my, my accent was further contaminated. What can I say? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 10, beginning at verse 5. This is what Isaiah says, quoting God. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. So understand, God is using the Assyrians, the most warlike and cruel regional superpower of the day, to crush the covenant people of God. God is using them to trample them down like mud in the streets. That's what the text says. But this is not what he, that is the Assyrian, intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. Are not my commanders all kings, he says. In other words, other nations have their commanders, but even my commanders are already regional puppet kings. They're, they're, they're up market. This is a much bigger outfit. Is not, has not Calno fared like Carchemish? Is not Hamat like Arpad and Samaria like Damascus? That is, on the basis of the cities I've already crushed, do you really think these new ones can stand up against me? As my hand sees the kingdoms of the idols, kingdoms whose images excel those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not deal with Jerusalem and her images as I dealt with Samaria and her idols? Isaiah comments, when the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. For he says, by the strength of my hand I have done this, and by my wisdom, because I have understanding. I removed the boundaries of nations. I plundered their treasures. Like a mighty one, I subdued their kings. As one reaches into a nest, so my hand reached for the wealth of the nations. As people gather abandoned eggs, so I gathered all the countries. Not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. And God says, does the axe raise itself above the person who swings it or the saw boast against the one who uses it? That is, if the Assyrians are doing these things, it's because God is using them as a tool. And what right does the tool have to boast against the one who's using it? It's stunning language. As if a rod were to wield the person who lifts it up or a club brandish the one who is not wood. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors and so forth. So, here is a text where God says he will send the Assyrians to punish his own people. Then he'll punish the people who punished his people because they did it with all the wrong attitudes and motives. Put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. In other words, both propositions are true. God is absolutely sovereign. He's using nations as if they're nothing more than tools in his hands. But that doesn't mitigate the responsibility of the nations. 
And these people are making choices. I finished this city off, <laughs> I'm going for that one. And I'll get all their wealth too. <laughs> I'll pick it up just the way you pick up eggs out of a bird's nest. But that doesn't mean that God is asleep at the switch. He still holds them all responsible. But perhaps the most dramatic example of this in all of Scripture concerns the death of Christ. There are quite a number of passages we, we could turn to, but how about this one in Acts chapter 4? Peter and John have faced their first real opposition. They gather with their own people, chapter 4, verses 23 and following. And they pray, quoting Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed one, against His Messiah. And then, verses 27 and 28, here you'll hear both propositions. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, supposing you buy verse 27 and cut verse 28 out, what happens? If you buy into verse 27 and cut verse 28, then you preserve Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. Why did Jesus go to the cross? There was a two-bit conspiracy at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, and that's why Jesus went to the cross. Stop. Period. Nothing to do with atonement. Nothing to do with the mind of God. Nothing to do with voluntary sacrifice. Just a bit of real politique in the first century. That's it. Supposing you buy the second verse, 28, but not verse 27, then what do you have? They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Well, that proves then that Jesus died according to the plan of God. And if Pilate did what he did and Herod did what he did, well, well, of course they did. I mean, God moved them to do it that way. It's not their fault. I mean, they just did what God planned should happen. That's what the text says. But if nobody's responsible for putting Jesus on the cross because God is sovereign, then it's difficult to imagine what responsibility should attach to any of us for anything, simply because God is sovereign. No, to make sense of the cross, to make sense of the most central redemptive event in the entire history of salvation, you have to believe those two propositions. That is, you have to believe those two propositions are mutually compatible. That is, you are holding to compatibilism. God is absolutely sovereign. If Jesus dies on the cross, it's because of God's plan. As the book of Revelation puts it, slain in the mind of God from before the foundation of the world and prefigured already in the, the yearly sacrifices at Passover and, and in the yearly sacrifices of Yom Kippur with, with the blood of the animals brought into the most holy place, configured again and again and again. It was God's plan. It wasn't an accident. It's why Jesus dares say in the Gospel of John, no one takes my life from me. I, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. He, he's not the first Christian martyr. He's not a martyr in any sense at all. He's a voluntary sacrifice. Do you not know that I could still call 12 legions of angels? But that doesn't mitigate the responsibility of those immediately on hand to nail Jesus to the cross, nor does it mitigate our responsibility, for it was my sin that nailed him there. Now, once you have bought in to the central compatibility of these two propositions, you are close, very close, to the doctrine of the mystery of providence. Now, at this point, it would be possible to go on a long excursus about how this gets tied to notions of will, about how God operates in eternity to work things out in time, to theological disputes in the history of the church, all of which things interest me hugely. But more central than all of them are the biblical data that establish the priority of these two propositions, the non-negotiability of these two propositions for every thoughtful Christian right through Scripture, even if you are to understand the cross. 
I do not know exactly how we can simultaneously say that there was a wretched conspiracy in the courts of minor officialdom at the eastern end of the, consp uh, of the Mediterranean, and that's what put Jesus on the cross, and say all those officials did what God's hand had determined before and should be done. I do not know. I could give you lots of explanations about secondary causalities and the relationship of time and eternity and cite to you theologians across the centuries that have tried to show that these things are not logically incompatible, but showing that they're not logically incompatible is not the same thing as being able to prove that they must be. But everywhere, Scripture revels in the mystery of providence. And once again, we are driven back to trust in Christ. Now, under that large heading, then, comes many, many, many other things. Come many other things. Notions, for example, of God using temporal circumstances to chasten us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. But he also knows how to chasten us. Every son, he, he chastens. That's what Proverbs says. That's what Hebrews 12 says. He chastens us. He builds us up. He puts us through hard circumstances. And that's why the Apostle Paul, for example, in 2 Corinthians 12, can say in order to keep him from becoming conceited, God actually sent a, a thorn in the flesh, but it's also called a messenger of Satan. From one perspective, God sent the thorn in the flesh. From another perspective, Satan sent this message. Why? To keep me from becoming conceited. Well, oh, it wasn't Satan's interest to keep Paul from becoming conceited. God intended it for good. And of course, one day in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no thorns in the flesh. But meanwhile, in this damned world, God, in the mysteries of providence, uses even such things as these to remind us of eternity, to keep us humble, to discipline us as his dearly loved children to prepare us for conformity to Christ, to make us homesick for heaven. I wish now that I could take you through several dozen scriptures and show you how the doctrine of providence works out in so many of them. But I rush on now to my last two. Number five, insights from the centrality of the incarnation and the cross. The fact of the matter is we don't have a God who is merely sovereign. Sovereign though he is, he is not merely sovereign. This sovereign God who controls a warring nation like Assyria is also the God who cries, turn, turn, why will you die? The Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Manifest in Christ Jesus, he's the one who denounces the hypocrites and, and the religious fakeries and, and the cities of his day with tears and blistering language, as in Matthew 23, and then weeps over the city. If the Bible as a whole teaches us that sin and suffering and catastrophe and so on are all a mark of our lostness, of our hopelessness, of our despair, when Jesus starts healing people and casting out demons and ordering nature, all of these things stand in the Gospels as the backward effluent from the cross of his making things right. That is, before he actually gets to the cross, he's already ordering things as they should be. Do you recall this passage from Matthew 8? Verse 18 and following, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Just before that, verse 14, when he came to Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on them. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all their sick. And then this. This is stunning. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. It was to fulfill the fourth servant song, what we usually refer to as Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. The New Testament writers again and again and again insist that the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 53 is bound up with Jesus' death on the cross. Matthew is saying something even more. He's saying when he casts out a demon, when he heals someone who's sick, he is already fulfilling Isaiah 53 in the light of the cross to which he is going. It's part of the backward flow from the cross. Because out of the cross comes the death of death. Out of the cross comes the killing of disease. Out of the cross comes restoration of men and women to God. Out of the cross comes resurrection existence. Out of the cross comes life from the dead. So that every one of Jesus' miracles during his ministry is a reflection of God's love for us in Christ Jesus as in anticipation of the cross. He fulfills Isaiah 53 until Isaiah 53 is finally fulfilled on the cross. In other words, the kind of sovereign God we serve is the sovereign God who gives his only son that we might be forgiven and enter into new life. And that changes everything. Islam has a rich doctrine of the sovereignty of God. There are many texts that insist that Allah is merciful. The theme that God is loving is very hard to find in Islam. But we insist the Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. This has always been understood by Christians in every generation. In the first three centuries, Christians often spoke of Jesus reigning from the cross. You have to think about that language. Of course, we're a republic. We don't have a lot of uh, time for kings and things. The last one we had didn't turn out too well. But when we think of monarchy, probably most of us gravitate toward thinking of the British monarchy, which of course is a constitutional monarchy. Nobody in biblical times thought of constitutional monarchs. What monarchs do is reign. They rule. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has precisely two powers, and she dare not exercise either one of them without the sanction of her prime minister, or she'll cause a constitutional crisis. She has no real power except moral suasion. A lot of pomp. She's a figurehead, head of state, but not head of government. But in the first century, if you were a king, you reigned. You ruled. So to speak of Christ as king, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth, is spectacularly sweeping. But he's also the king who is the suffering servant. And for the first 300 years, Christians smiled at each other and winked and grinned at the thought, our king reigns from the cross, the place for condemned criminals abandoned by God and man. His throne is the cross. It is much, much harder to abandon a sovereign God, to turn away from a sovereign God who takes our sin in his own body on the tree than to turn away from a sovereign God who's merely a fatalistic deity. World War I was a desperately brutal war, trench warfare, perhaps one of the most stupid wars in human history. Ten million young men died, besides everybody else that died. They would mow each other down with howitzers and artillery guns and machine guns across a no-man's land that pushed back a few hundred yards this way and a few hundred yards that way. It was miserable. A whole generation wiped out. And on the British side, it produced a number of very remarkable poets. One of the least of them was a chap called Edward Shillitoe. 
Most of his poetry was not particularly memorable. Rupert Owen was much stronger. But Edward Shillitaw did write one very remarkable poem. It's called Jesus of the Scars. In the third stanza, he's picturing all of the suffering and then using the language of John 20 where he appears to the disciples in closed doors, behind closed doors. He says, if when the doors are shut, thou drawest near, only show us thy scars, those wounds of thine. We know today what wounds are. Never fear. Show us thy wounds. We know the countersign. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to thy throne. And to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak, and not a god has wounds but thou alone. In your bleakest hour, when you are suffering the most or watching around you those whom you love to be suffering, when philosophical discourses on the mystery of providence seem remarkably arid, go back to the cross. And finally, insights from taking up our cross and therefore insights from the persecuted global church. For the fact of the matter is the New Testament says more about the suffering of Christians in the context of persecution than of suffering in any other sphere. We think of suffering primarily in terms of cancer or old age or poverty or war. And somewhere or other, the Bible addresses all of those kinds of things too. But if you are calculating things on the basis of sheer frequency, the texts that most commonly speak of suffering in the New Testament have to do with Christian suffering. And they are remarkable. I'm sure you know some of them. Here's 1 Peter 2. It is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. Do you hear that? To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. Oh, I know Christ's cross is more than an example. Peter will go on to show why it's more than an example. But it's not less than an example. Indeed, he committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Of course, Peter says, there is uniqueness to his suffering. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. But nevertheless, it is also an example that you should follow in his steps. Do you recall what Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1.29? For you have been called on behalf of Christ not only to believe on his name, but to suffer for his sake. That's what the Word of God says. Do you recall that remarkable passage in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, when the apostles are first beaten up the very first time? Then the, the apostles rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. It took me a long time to figure out just what was going on there. But a few years, it suddenly dawned on me. It was pretty obvious. I should have seen it earlier. Picture Peter and John. They've lived through the farewell discourse and 
Jesus' careful teaching in John chapter 15. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they accept me, they accept you. If a slave is not above his master, you're going to get what I get. Count on it. Or teaching from chapter 10 of Matthew, which insists that, that you'll get, get hauled before kings and governors. And, and don't worry about what you'll say in those days. Trust the Holy Spirit. He'll give you what you need. And then Jesus dies, rises again, teaches the apostles. He ascends to heaven, and they're told to wait. Pentecost comes, and suddenly there's glory and spectacular power everywhere. Thousands are converted, and pretty soon there are 5,000 men in the church besides women and children. The glory is spectacular, and the Christians are in such good repute amongst the population that some people are scrambling on the sidewalk just to get under Peter's shadow. Superstitious lot, maybe, but it shows that at least they were in good repute. Of course, the authorities weren't too pleased, but nevertheless, what a blast. This is fun. I can imagine Peter saying to John, isn't this wonderful? This is, this is spectacular. Times of refreshment have finally dawned. And John says, yeah, but I am a little worried. You remember what Jesus said the night that he was betrayed? You know, about suffering and Remember how he said, take up your cross and follow him? If we don't take up our cross daily, we can't be his disciples? I mean, this is fun. I acknowledge it. This is wonderful to watch the power of the gospel transforming people, and the nations are coming in as well. This is really spectacular. It's wonderful. But I wonder if we're doing something wrong. And they preach on and preach on. They get threatened, preach on. More people get converted. And finally, they get beaten up. And they say, yes, it's about time. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Now suppose every time here in America somebody insults us for the gospel's sake or dismisses us or laughs at us or opposes us. Supposing every time our first instinctive reaction were to say, thank you, Jesus. I want to suffer for the name. Oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. For to this I have been called, not only to believe in his name, but also to suffer for his sake. Let me tell you, there are lots and lots of Christians in the world in the southern Sudan who know about this text. In North Korea, they know about this text. In Iran, they know about this text. I travel to these places. I've met so many Christians who've come out of brokenness and persecution. I could regale you with stories till the next morning and I wouldn't have begun the repertoire. There have been more Christian conversions since 1800 than in the previous 1800 years combined. There have been more Christian martyrs since 1800 than in the previous 1800 years combined. And to this you have been called. Now let me draw this to a close. I'm done. I'm just going to make three practical conclusions. Number one, the approach I have given you to reflections on suffering and evil is not a simple proof texting. You're not leaving tonight with half a dozen biblical texts that sort of solve the problem of evil. a couple of verses to answer all conceivable questions. Rather, what I am arguing is that a Christian worldview rests on huge biblically established theological frameworks, all of which have to be accepted all the time. And this massive structure is stable enough, it's comprehensive enough, it's big enough to give you a great deal of stability when you go through your darkest hours. In other words, this is not necessarily the most helpful thing to say to someone when they're first entering into the throes of terrible suffering. You've just been diagnosed with stage four melanoma. Do you want this lecture? I'm arguing something different that Christians need a theological prophylactic already well established in our minds so that we think about these things in a Christian way before the evil days come and then we'll be far more stable 
far more mature in the way we face these things than we would otherwise be. Second, this lecture has focused on intellectual and worldview issues, how to think about these things in a prophylactic way before the evil day comes. That's what I've given you. But I would be the first to insist that when people are actually going through actual crises, something rather different may be needed. In a tsunami, you need helicopters to bring in water and shelter. You need the Marines to establish some order. You need food supplies, supply lines, discipline, rescue teams. And when people are suffering individually, it may not be the time to enter into a deep discussion about the mysteries of providence. Friends of mine not too long ago gave birth to a baby with very severe spina bifida, the most severe degree that I've ever seen. Amongst other problems, the baby had no eyelids. So until the baby died, we set up a team every 10 minutes by the baby, dropping artificial tears into the baby's eyeballs so that the baby's eyeballs would not dry and crack. That's what was needed. Yet nevertheless, I insist that if, if the gospel structures, the biblical structures are in place, as they were for these parents, then even through their tears and loneliness and grief, they sorrowed, but not as those who have no hope. And in consequence of these miserable events, they became missionaries to East Asia. Finally, Christians who get to know God well in the light of Scripture, as a rule, think in terms of the problem of evil, in terms of theodicy, justifying the ways of God to man, not in intellectual categories about how to figure out the problem of evil. In the Bible itself, it seems to me, that the Christians who are most mature who think about these things display two other attitudes. Number one, they admit their guilt before God and cry to God for renewal and revival. I beg of you when you go home tonight, before you turn out the light, quietly read through Nehemiah 8 and 9 where the people are in terrible straits, but borne along by the Spirit of God. They don't try to blame God for their sufferings. They acknowledge their sins, cry to God in repentance, and seek the face of God in renewal of the covenant. And last, such people also are quick to talk about the sheer goodness of God. Let me tell you about a, about a man, we'll call him Bill Johns, that's not his name, but it'll do. Bill Johns was as skinny as a beanpole, six foot four, single, went out as a missionary to a Latin American country, learned Spanish well, became a very fruitful evangelist, trainer, church planter, pastor in South America. After about 15 years there, uh, he married a missionary lass who was down there on her own. And rather later in life than most, they had a little girl. When the little girl was about three and a half, the mission wanted to send both of them back to Trinity, where I teach in Chicago, so that he could get a PhD in New Testament because they wanted him to up the level of training in Latin America. He had knew the language by this time, knew the culture, and, and the, the PhD would help him. He came to Trinity, started his PhD, and his wife, at that point, six months into it, was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. The usual mastectomy, chemotherapy, fighting for her life, but she seemed to come out of it. 
for a while, things seemed to be all right. He started up his studies again. The church helped him. His mission board helped him. His family, a godly family up in the Twin Cities, they helped him. Continued with his studies. Six months later, he was diagnosed with advanced stomach cancer. The hospitals in the Chicago area that are known for cancer care, Lutheran General, for example, is well known for its cancer care. They told him there was nothing they could do for him. The mission sent him to the Mayo Clinic. And the Mayo Clinic said, we don't know this will work, but we're willing to take out 90% of your stomach and give you drugs that are actually designed for colon cancer and things like that. They, they may work. We've had some success. They took out 90% of his stomach, gave him these experimental drugs. Six months later, skinnier than ever, eating about 10 times a day because his stomach couldn't hold much food, he came back to Trinity to work on his PhD. Skinnier than ever. He did another six months, and his wife's cancer came back, and she died. Eventually, he came back to Trinity and finished his PhD. The last time I saw him, his daughter was now nine and a half or ten. They were in our church, going back to Latin America. And as he spoke in our church for half an hour on that Sunday morning, all he talked about was the goodness of God. Because, you see, he understood the gospel. And that, I tell you, is merely normal Christianity. Thank you for listening.